Jeff Ogilvy survives wing foot. Now the moment Aaron Badley has waited. Curry Webb is the five-time Australian Open champion. Golf at its best by one of the best in golf, Peter Thompson. Stand in front of a crowd like this today and win the PGA Championship is pretty special. He's done it at last. Greg Norman. Jones gets his name on the Stonehaven Cup. Leash been to 11 under. Now we've got a new leader, kids. Here it is! Adam Scott. A life changer. Coming up next, you have unrestricted access to golf across Australia and the world. Thanks to Golf Australia, we're going inside the ropes. G'day everybody, welcome to episode 17 of Inside the Robes. Great to be here, Andy Marr, alongside the one and only Mark Hayes again. Hello, Marcus. Hello, Andy. Oh, Marcus, just... where'd that come from? That's all right. I mean, we've all had funny names in here. I mean, someone called Blakey Gazelle once, and I've never seen that sort of motion in action, mate. I... Sorry, g'day, g'day, Martin good, Blake. Good morning. Uh, what about Marbo? I've heard uh, Andrew Marbo. Marr referred to as Marbo Where did Gazelle come I've only ever known It was an old footy nickname, uh, which was sort of meant to refer to speed across the ground, leg speed. So, with but an it's, ironic <laughs> twist. But it's now become an ironic nickname. I do remember yeah. one day, Hazy, just to digress, we used to play a game of footy. Um, the Age used to play the Herald Sun. And while I didn't work for the age, I worked for a little adjunct of the age, a little magazine arm, and I played in this game. And I was dropping back. We were playing a game at Albert Park one day, and we were all over there. All of a sudden, we're poleaxing him. I've kicked a couple by this stage. I'm dropping back. It's going to have a field day here. And I cop this knee in the back of my head. And I <laughs> dust myself off and pick myself up. Everyone's just patting Gazelle on the back going, oh, absolute hanger, mate. He's put his knee, remember that? You put your knee right in the back of my head. I do, because you passed comment to me, but I think I was on my way to four that day. <laughs> I reckon I want to kick six, but I was a bit concussed after that. <laughs> Sorry, mate. So you could get off the ground. And I did see you uh, get belted by Robbie Muir oh, that, that, twice, twice, in, in, twice in a game. One game, that's true. Mm. That is yeah. true. Honestly, we could have an entire separate podcast on Blakey's football stories. <laughs> got a few? <laughs> yes, definitely. definitely. Well, we've got a few golf stories to tell mm. today, I reckon, because Bob Shearer is going to be joining us on our road to the Open. This is a... Feature of uh, Inside the Ropes from here until we get to the Australian Open this year? Yeah, up to the Australian on the 23rd, 26th of November is the, the four tournament days of the Emirates Australian Open. And just, we really can't wait. Some some great players already announced, some more big ones on the way, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed. And uh, for this, we're about roughly 10 weeks away now. And uh, to start off this series with uh, one of the great characters of Australian golf is, is going to be a treat. And one of the great Australian Opens, Blakey, like this, until you go back sometimes and remember the sorts of fields we used to get and the quality of opponent that the local golfers got to sell got to challenge themselves against. Well, in that particular one we're talking about, 1982 at the Australian, Bob Shear went through, played three of the four days, including the last round with Jack, the one and only Jack Nicholas. Exactly. Yeah, uh, that's Stewart not a bad thing to have <laughs> on your CV. <laughs> Man, can't wait to speak to him about it. Cam mm. McCormick's going to join us as well. Coach of so many, um, you know, fine players on planet Earth right now. He's in Australia as we speak. We're sitting here at about quarter past ten on a Thursday morning, sitting down to do the podcast. He's at the uh, PGA Golf Expo up there on the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, great thing the PGA is doing. Uh, the PGA of Australia is bringing together, you know, not only the Australian golf community, but, you know, attracting interest from overseas by sort of assembling a whole he- heap of um, professional teachers, um, also some trade shows and, and all sorts of speakers who are um, bringing the latest in golf news, uh, the best in teaching practices. And, you know, the, the PGA, you know, we all have our critics in the golf industry. That what the Australian PGA does better than just about anyone in the world is is a breeding ground for teachers. And they the coaches that we put out, and we'll, we'll speak to Cam McCormick today, but, uh, you know, they're learning. All the PGA pros around Australia are flocked there to learn and be up on their practices, and it's really good. Encourage you all to get down to your local pros and take take advantage of their knowledge. Bit disappointed I didn't get a gig for that no, one. But uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. for the listeners, Cam McCormick is the coach of Jordan Spieth, which we mentioned. He also coaches So Yon Yu, who's the number one player on the women's circuit. Who, who else, Hazy? He coaches Carl Phillips, I know, is one of yeah. our best junior players. Well, he's got Austin Connolly, hasn't he? The young yeah. skateboarder from Canada. There Correct. He coaches yeah. uh, Celine Boutier, I think, the woman who won on the Symmetra Tour last year, and is, uh, the last week, and she's now second on that. So and he's, he's covering kid, all spectrums. He's got the kid, I wrote his name down, Noah Goodwin, the kid that won the US, yep. junior, US junior. A couple so, of years ago. Yeah. Yep, so he's got, I mean, he's got a good stable of players. And um, our challenge from I've never spoken to Cam McCormick before, Nor so I'm looking I. forward to it. 
just reading about him, I think our challenge is to get him to pump up his own tyres just once. Like in the interview, right. we, ha- we have to try and get him to say something positive about himself because apparently he is about the most self-effacing human being really? on the planet. And and grew up uh, playing the sandbelt courses and breaking, I believe, breaking into the this is, sandbelt courses. This is what we need to get to the bottom of. He, yeah. I don't think he's ever said which course it is. That's my mission, Andy, oh, to find out what gold. course he was. Right, mm. magnificent. So he'll be joining us in a moment. We'll break into you know the news of the week once Cam McCormack uh, picks the phone up. The big news that um, Connor was breaking, and I saw you sent a text to us last night, uh, Blake, is we went to. Well, most of us going. I went to bed after. So I tried to go to sleep having watched it last night. I went to oh. the cinema to watch it last night. Clowns. Took me a while to. I had to, it took me a while to turn all the lights off. I had to get <laughs> every one of the kids' dolls in the house. I had to throw in the rubbish bin. Uh, any hint of there being a clown in the house? I had to burn it. Uh, so it took me a while to get to sleep. So your text came through pretty late, and I did read that Jason Day has um, changed caddies. Big, going into the BMW. It's, it's actually pretty big news, Hazy, because uh, mm. Cole Swatton has been his caddy, coach, mentor, father figure, or all, all of the above, yeah. since he was 12. So it's been a long-term relationship that he's had. Now, he's going to retain Cole as his coach. He's spoken to a lot of the journos over in Chicago this morning, and he said that Cole was quite upset about it, but that he feels that he needed to make a change. Uh, he felt that the chemistry wasn't that great between them just recently. A little bit similar, along similar lines to what Rory McIlroy said earlier this year about JP McManus. Uh, that you know, just <laughs> th- just He's the horse owner, isn't he? Yeah, we yeah. better go. Sorry, JP Fitzgerald. <laughs> JP Fitzgerald. Sorry, uh, that you know, just a little bit of tension between them on the course, and it wasn't good for their friendship. So let's try a different caddy. So his caddy is going to be Luke Reardon, who played his junior golf with him, went to the same school as him, who's actually his roommate. So he's going to get one of his contemporaries out there with him. Uh, it's an interesting one. I'm going, to, I'm going to put it out here now and say I think it's good. I've always looked at Jason's relationship with Colin, and as great as it is, it's unusual to have your coach carrying the bag for you out on the course. And I just wonder whether it might have got a bit too close. There you go. That's interesting. That's, I'll put yeah, that out there. Yeah. Jason good. said in his uh, speech to the press over there today that it's easier when things are going well. Uh, so presumably, I guess that means they don't have to tinker as much as they normally would. Um, he said, since I haven't been going as well, it you know, hasn't been as easy, and I just don't want to lose him out of my life. So it's easiest thing for him is to part ways in a caddying sense because I still need him in a coaching sense. So I wonder how important it is, and, and this is something we speak to Cam about, maybe even with Bob when we get you know, get to him. Um, in fact, Cam's here, is he? Cam, Cam McCormack joins us right now, as a matter of fact, so we may as well not waste another second no. and say good day to Cameron McCormack, who does join us from uh, the PGA Expo up there on the Sunshine Coast. Hello, Cameron. How are you, mate? Hey, how you doing? Thanks yeah, for joining lo- us. Loving being up here. That's how I'm doing. <laughs> well, we'll talk to you about the Expo in a moment, but we're just joining. You join us in the middle of a conversation. It's Andy Mar, Mark Hayes and Martin Blake. You join us in the middle of a conversation we're having about... Um, the Jason Day's decision to change caddies and just how big a decision that would be. And you know, obviously on the way through with you, we'll probably have a chat about um, Jordan Spieth and Mike Grella at, at some stage. Uh, from a coach's perspective, how big is the relationship that you have with the caddy via, through, with the player through the caddy? Is that is that something that you need to work on? Yeah, the, the relationship that from my perspective, a coach has with the caddy is it's massively important. You see, the caddy is the closest window into like seeing the performance in the eyes of the player outside of the player themselves. So uh, I always describe Michael as riding shotgun in the passenger seat and giving navigational directions to Jordan as he's playing. And that gives me um, a, a great perspective to then lean on as a coach in um, tournament debriefs. So after a round or after a tournament, I can then get information from Jordan and Michael and then filter it through the appropriate, um, I guess, concepts in my head to try and understand what it is that we might uh, use from that to improve. Uh, so there's going to be a learning curve, a learning curve now uh, for, for Colin, who's still on the role of a coach, but no longer yet has that perspective of being able to see and be part of the conversations inside the ropes. Uh, but as smart as Colin is and as effective as the relationship has been to this point, uh, I don't see that it's going to take very long for them to overcome whatever challenge it might pose. But yeah, to that point, it's, it's critical. So how sharp an eye, Cameron, does the caddy, from your perspective, need to have in terms of 
knowledge of the swing, knowledge of the mechanics that make that swing work, uh, understanding the you know the mentality of the player, how he's sort of coping out there, you know, in the cut and thrust of a round. How how developed does the skill set of a caddy need to be from that perspective, from your point of view? Yeah, I think the second part of that is far more important than the first. You know, caddy can caddy can be in a deputy or an assistant instructor, uh, giving being able to shoot video uh, is critical from the right orientation, the right angles, at the right quality, um, being able to then provide a little bit of feedback as long as the feedback is echoing the sentiment of, a, of the primary instructor or coach. But moreover, the caddy's role and responsibility that is critical is being kind of an onboard psych, psych, uh, sports psychologist and also an onboard uh, tactician, understanding that the player might have some tendencies to play aggressive or conservative or somewhere in between those, and it may require that, um, given the place they are in the tournament, that different strategy is required, so that becomes a discussion point. And that's a hard thing to learn by having only one day on the job. In fact, I would say that uh, five to ten years of all of that acquired knowledge is necessary to be a world-class caddy. Um, and then further than that, there's also a golf IQ element that the caddies, as they spend time around these world-class players, begin to recognize that the player picks up on nuances mm. and very small details about the environment, the wind, the temperature, uh, the how the ball is lying in the grass and the rough or uh, on the surface of the grass and the fairway or even in the sand, and then makes shot decisions based on that. And the better the caddy is um, up to speed in that high-level golf IQ, um, the better they can, the better job they can do in providing recommendations when the player pulls them in. And then, I mean, it goes without saying that the best caddies in the world are also good green readers, and that's an acquired skill as well. It takes years and years of practice. So I think it's a good thing that uh, who, who Jason Day brought in does have some experience playing golf at a relatively high level, but uh, there's still going to be a lot of on-the-job learning that's needed. So it's Cameron, it's really interesting. Yeah, it is fa- it's fascinating. And I want to get to, to talk to you more about Golf IQ in a few minutes, if you don't mind. It's Mark Hayes here. Uh, nice to speak to you uh-huh. again. I, 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 I guess if you could walk us through how come you come to be in Australia at a critical time of the season. I'm, I know you've, you've got a full dance card at the best of times, but this is a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty important time of the year. It must be great for you to get home. And tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the PGA Expo. Yes, yeah, so I'm honoured to get back here and present for the PGA of Australia at the uh, first PGA Expo. So it's a, a trade show and, edu- and, and an educational event that um, the first running of a combined um, an event like this. And I guess any time you step up in front of your peers, it's special. But then to come home and present to a peer group that largely I've, I've probably only met 2% of them, so to make new friends and uh, influence them with some lessons that I've learned coaching at both an amateur level um, club level and also the level that helps players win major championships is an insight that um, I'm happy to share. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the schedule's full. It's a critical part of the season. But you know, if we've got a major championship on the women's side and we've got next to a major championship, a player of the event on the men's side, and if all the work's been done in the lead up, if all the, um, the right pruning and watering of the seeds have, have uh, taken place, then it should be um, a smooth sailing at those events. Uh, and to the extent that you can kind of influence or correct things remotely, I feel like we can do a pretty good job with that with all the players I coach, uh, given my experience with them. And if you didn't know much about the player that you're trying to help from a long distance away, it's an infinitely difficult task. But, yeah, if you've got some experience with them, then it's been doable. I guess it's getting increasingly hard to find a week off with the different aspects of the the game you you coach because you know we're not just talking PGA Tour or LPGA Tour. You've got people at all levels and all different ages. So I guess that finding that weekend off it's going to be hard work anyway. Um, with, and with, without sort of being in your pocket, is it weird for you to be a rock star when you come home now? <laughs> to that two percent. I'm not a rock star. No, no, no. I, I, the rock stars will be the Aria Awards around Australian Open time in Sydney. If you're wondering where they'll be. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what? In golf communities, in golf circles, I've noticed that um, the Dallas Fort Worth Airport, only because that's Jordan's home, and therefore they kind of know who I am. And outside <laughs> of that, I, I fly under the radar, and I have a better relationship with like hiding behind the curtain anonymity than I do from the from the front. So it makes um, the times when I'm in the public eye 
um, they're 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 nice, they're exciting, but they're certainly not something I. I pursue. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand that, and I'm not trying to put you into a corner here, but I know that for a fact that everyone's, you know, rushing to your seminars when you speak there and eager to get a lesson and from you. If you if you are doing that, I, I understand that you might have give, snuck a little lesson into Prime Minister of New Zealand, a former Prime Minister of New Zealand. Yeah, so John Keyes yesterday was a great twenty thirty minutes that we spent. Um, he's uh, he's an excited golfer, he's a motivated golfer, which is the type of golfer you want to work with, whether they're an eight handicap like he is, or a 36 handicap, or one of the world's best. Without the enthusiasm and the um, that self improvement mechanism that um, is existing with him, it's going to be hard to, to um, bond and create common ground in terms of like providing any swing recommendations or um, improvements. So, yeah, it was awesome. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with um, President. Um, uh, President George W. Bush in um, in Dallas after he got out of office, and to then do the same, granted on a very um, very limited basis here, just a twenty thirty minute lesson was, was exciting. Cameron, can you? Uh, it's Martin Blake here. Would you be able to go back a bit through your background for the listeners? I I, I know it just by chance, but you know you grew up in Melbourne. I think you used to bust into a few sandbelt courses, <laughs> did you? And play, and uh, I've read that somewhere. I mean, you, I'm not sure which club you were. Uh, you played your golf at, but you grew up playing in the sand belt, didn't you? No, I grew up playing at Eastern Golf Club in the Eastern. Fact, and I okay. started playing golf late. I was, I was a real footballer since Dad played um, a little bit professionally, and that was in my blood, and I was a tennis player as well. And um, I developed late physically, and so I had to get out of football. Uh, otherwise, I was going to get killed. And then I joined Eastern Golf Club and got pretty good quick, pretty quick and represented Eastern in junior pennants and... Then, uh, of all people to cross paths with, I crossed paths path, path with Mark Allen at the start of the Australasian se- um, season one year, and he had brought down Kevin Youngblood and Mike Winfrey, two guys that played with him at university in America, Texas Tech. And I caddied for uh, one of them, Kevin Youngblood, and he told me about college golf, and at that point I was all in. So Eastern Golf Club for three years turned into a scholarship to go to the United States, and I was there for a total of five years. Tried to play professionally for two back home here and also in America and uh, basically just ran out of money. I didn't have much financial backing behind me. You slept in your VW van, didn't you, at one point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was an orange combi van. I was traveling around America in it. And, uh, yeah, there's there's some exciting, exciting stories that go along with that. All all pros have done that at some point, haven't they? Exactly. Some that are PG rated and some that are not PG rated. So <laughs> I'm, t- I'm tipping that the, the non PG rated ones would have a lot to do with Mark Allen, Cameron. Would that be yeah. right to say? Yeah, in all likelihood, at least he's influenced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. <There. laughs> now, which of, which of the Sandbelt clubs did you break in and play? We, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. It's been no, written I, in many articles never, about you, and it, you, you've really got to come clean on this. Yeah, I've never been on record telling which clubs, and I think I'm just going to keep it that way. <laughs> Give us a street. <laughs> the street address, <laughs> suburb. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just going to keep it that way. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> You're too good for us. You're now, I read probably, some. Uh, I read some quotes. Five I, of them. <laughs> I, I read some quotes uh, that you like to use, and I found this one yesterday. This is in a feature about you in one of the magazines from someone called I think it's Anais Nin, an author. We see yeah. think we see things how we we are, not how they are, and that's about yeah. that's about. Having an objecti- uh, objective view, is that what that's one of your things? Absolutely. Yeah, and you're, made props for digging that up. I think I've used that in a presentation here or there, and you've clearly done your research, so um, great job on that. But, yes, uh, it's about the more we can be objective and self-reflective and not have emotion involved in um, that practice, then the easier it is for us to tolerate our current level of performance if it's, maybe substandard to what we want, and also, probably more importantly than that, um, create a direction and pursue that direction without being burdened by mistakes. You know, if someone fears making mistakes, then they probably um, fear also the success that comes through making those mistakes because it's only through making mistakes that uh, we ultimately uh, learn from that. So uh, I don't like people that are um, trying to avoid uh, the error. I like people that try and embrace error and try and learn from it. So that's objective or reflective ability is a foundation of being able to do that. Now tell us a little bit about working with Spieth because I see him as a competitive beast. I've never seen anyone, I don't think, like that who can step up and do the business so well when the pressure's on him. 
Uh, he came to you at 12 in Dallas, so you've had a long relationship with him. What's he like to work with and uh, how many people have said to you, you've got to get rid of that chicken wing that he has? <laughs> I've had plenty of advice thrown at me over the years from many different sources, from commentators at the highest level in the game, that, uh, uh, on TV, to um, even club members at the, the club that I used to teach at would, would tell me that uh, this is what he needs to change. And there's, there's a lot of comedy involved in, in all of that, given the success that he was having at the time I was getting the advice and the success that he's had since. But nonetheless, I think the most important part of the question is what's he like to work with, and he's amazing to work with. He's always he's the first work, the person that wants to raise the bar and make something more difficult. He's the first person to um, express that no matter how hard something is that I might have him do, that he'll, he'll get it on the next swing. And if he doesn't get it on the next swing, then he'll definitely get it on the next swing if he, he catches my drift there. Um, hard worker, yes. Honest person. Um, absolutely faithful person. Absolutely uh, very strong uh, value set, which makes uh, him someone that you not only want to be around professionally, but you want to be around personally because um, it's hard to for that to not affect you and influence you positively, even though I'm double his age. So <laughs> I, I could be his dad. I'm not. Um, we've got a relationship that's lasted for 12 years. It feels like I'm his dad, particularly at times like around when he was 15, 16 years, years old. Um, we have healthy conversation, debate that sometimes sounds like it's disagreement, but we always find common ground. And, and that's, that's not something that I'm saying is bad. I'm actually saying that and highlighting it as a, as a good picture. Jordan himself believes in his own ability and believes in his ideas, but he's pretty quick to be receptive of ideas and he can be convinced that his ideas need to change. Um, so there's no sense of stubbornness there, but there's a sense of, I guess, um, practical, I need to understand the reasons why before I do something, which is, which is what gives him a great foundation of self-belief in not only what he can do in tournaments, come back from being down or um, lead the entire way or have a bad hole and bounce back from it, but just as much the self-belief that he shows in his own technique that it, it, it takes some shots over the bow, it takes some heavy hits at times when they talk about his Johnny Miller says he's got the weakest grip in professional golf and X, Y, and Z want to change that release pattern through uh, through impact for reasons. Yeah, the chicken wing. It's got the most famous chicken wing in the world, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. And, th- and those reasons are only based on stylistic preferences, only based on how they feel like a swing um, should look rather than perform. So it's only when performance wanes that we look underneath the hood and start to um, investigate what is it that we need to get back on track or put back in place. Cameron, oh, there's a million questions to ask you, yeah, Cameron. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we, Cameron, just I mean, in re, not in relation to Jordan specifically. Um, in speaking to a couple of people about your coaching style, you, you know, no one would ever say that Jordan Spieth is the best technician in world golf. Clearly, you, you just basically enunciated that. What he does do is get the ball in the hole better than anyone else. And I, I, uh, is it true that that's the sort of fundamental of your style that maybe you saw an Australian generation developing magnificent swings but not the ability to get the ball in the hole the quickest and that was something that is the fundamental basis of your teachings? Yeah, yeah, I, I much prefer to coach fighters. I much, I much prefer to coach players that um, if there's 10 dogs in a pack and there's one piece of meat, I, I'll coach the dog that has the greatest determination towards getting that piece of meat uh, over and above the dog that... Um, Prances around and, and, and looks pretty good as they're in the fight, but yet um, lacks the lacks the skill to win a go and get stuff to get the job done. Because you said um, that you said that about Austin Connolly, didn't you? I mean, he, he yeah, you, yeah. Wouldn't, you wouldn't look I, at I him. That, yeah, yep, absolutely. At the British Open this year, and, and he's had that since he was um, twelve years old when I first met him. And you know, if, if you're looking at psychological character traits that then predict great performance, it's, it's that grit, that determination, it's that um, bulletproof self-image that I look for, and if it's not there, I try and grow as fast as I possibly can. Um, Otherwise, at some point, they're just going to be left behind because they're going to be in that fight. And being in that fight and losing is not a good place to be. Um, And and you lose too many times, and you start to let it affect your self-image and and your self-belief. so Cameron, so Cameron, you that you say that about a player, right? You, you, you players know what they want to get from a coach. They want a coach who's they want a coach who's going to make him a better player. 
before you take a player on and get him into your stable or her, you know, her into your stable, do you try and assess and find out from them before you commit to work with them that they've got that fight within them? Are you Is that something that you see as almost a non-negotiable before you start working with somebody? Yeah, I wouldn't call it a non-starter. I wouldn't call it a deal-breaker. Yeah. Unless in the early relationship, they showed me that they couldn't develop it. Let's say they didn't possess it. Maybe it's because they've, they've been a mediocre performer relative to the standard that they're trying to compete at, professional or amateur or junior. But if, if you, they're not willing to, to do the things that would then lead to developing that type of attitude then it becomes a, a glass ceiling, doesn't it? It's it, it something that if they're not willing to work through, they can't break through. And then um, their, how high they can climb is dramatically limited. So certainly I think it at some point becomes uh, a deal breaker, but certainly not from, not from the start. And you only understand these things over time. You can try and do the best job you can in interviewing and gathering all the information from all the sources possible, but yet, you find things out later in the relationship that I'm sure you wish you would have known early on, um, maybe because there are strengths that you can lean on and try and grow more. Maybe there are weaknesses that show up at a later point um, that you would have know, liked to have known about earlier so you could address them. But um, everything comes to um, comes to the table at the, at, the, uh, at the time it comes to the table and you deal with it when it comes. So, Cam, you found the dog that wants to find that meat and you take him... You, they come off the range and you actually sit down, you look at stats, I understand, and, and you say, all right, the only reason you're not higher in the world rankings is your the stats show that you chip the ball from 50 metres to, to 10 metres. The, you know, you're know 188th on tour. Um, the good players, obviously far better than that. So you grind, you not grind them, but you, you push them to work on their statistical weakness. Is that fair enough? I think the statistics definitely, yeah, it's fair enough. I think the statistics are a great starting point, but understanding what creates that that statistic is also very important. So, if you look at Green's and regulations and um, and proximity to the hole, so proximity to the hole is basically strokes gained. How close I hit the hole um, tells me that I should uh, convert more often and therefore shoot a lower score than anyone else. But there's normally an inverse correlation as Green's and regulation goes up, proximity to the hole goes down because someone's firing away from flag. So. Understanding that stats are a good starting point. I think Frank Nobolo says that uh, stats are uh, are like a bikini. No, 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 it's Craig Perks, in fact, our Kiwi buddy. That says stats are like a bikini. They show you a lot, but they don't show you everything. So you can use them as a starting point. Uh, but then you've got to peel the onion back multiple layers beyond that to understand what's creating that. So in the case of, like, short game proximity, the, the, the one that you brought up, is it the deficiency in form, meaning the technique a person's using, or is it just the deficiency in picking the right shots, which is just a, a tactical challenge? Or is it, a, is it golf IQ? Is it that they can't recognize that certain lines allow them to do certain things with, with the ball that, frankly, they shouldn't be trying to do? So, yeah, that's your starting point, and then beyond that, you start digging, and then hopefully you hit gold or, um, or diamonds. Is there, is there a particular player? I, the, I know you're, you don't really ever talk about specific players, but there's someone who would surprise us other than Jordan, who you admire their tenacity as well, as in, in a way that you know they will get the absolute utmost out of themselves, whether they end up being number one in the world or number 273? Yeah, Soyeonju stands out as a fighter. She stands out as someone that the chips can be down, she can, be, um, she can start off falling around and, and seemingly always recover that round which is why for a long time there we've had two missed cuts this year, which are the first two, two missed cuts in a long period of time. One of those we would um, attribute to playing a golf course that she hadn't played ever and it's a golf course that really doesn't suit her eyes, but doesn't suit her game. And the other one was just a, a week of fatigue. Um, so, but yeah, I think going back to, uh, is there a player that I would identify that has that similar um, similar trait that plays at a high level? It definitely would be so young. Soyeon's been on the program with us, Cam, and um, she did accuse some of the Australians around her, I think maybe the caddy, I'm not sure whether you were in this, of uh, teaching her how to swear. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether, you, whether that's – you can be pinged for that or um, – No, I can't take responsibility for that, but Tommy Watson most definitely – Tommy, yes. Could. We've had him <laughs> on here as well. We, we, Tom Watson can also take responsibility for teaching her how to catch because when they first started working together – 
apparently tossed her balls that she would want to tee up with driver, and she couldn't catch them, and so she had to right. catch pretty quick. Right. <laughs> Pretty fast. <laughs> There's another Australian player called Sue O oh, who comes from Melbourne who's been working with you. Is that still happening and how's that going? Yeah, Sue's, Sue's beautiful. I love working with her. She's, um, she's the type of personality that is very easy to work with, always smiling, always looking to have fun. And she's probably the hardest worker in terms of like if we just assess work on time. Um, and we've got to shift her into understanding that time is one of those factors that we want to um, check the box on, but it's also the efficiency and the, the quality of the time that we're applying. So uh, she's made she's made great roads in the little over a year that I've been um, in roads in the little over a year that I've been working with her now, and I, I hope that it continues. I really enjoy spending time with her, and I feel like that there's a lot for us to accomplish as uh, as the months and years move forward. Cam, one last question about a, a young Australian player. I know you've started doing some work with Carl Phillips, who you know, is off the radar a lot here, given he's based in the States and just a young fella, but he's got tremendous potential, hasn't he? What do you see in him? And is it, um, is it something you have to work on, the, the physicality, the, the repeatability physically of swings with, with kids like that to make sure they can keep playing through the years? Yeah, Carl's body type. He's 15 years old. I think he might be almost 16 now, uh, but he's stands to you and he looks like a man. He's very solidly built and his speed certainly speaks to that as well. He can create a lot of velocity and uh, one of those traits that you're looking for out of a very special individual is once you shake up their swing a little bit, kind of like oil and water, it, it, you can mix it up but eventually it finds its way and separates how quick it can separate, meaning how quickly they can take a change in a swing and then turn it into hitting good shots again versus hitting bad shots for a period of time. And Carl has that ability to change a swing and still hit good shots with it pretty mm. immediately. Wow. Great. So that's another marker that I look for. He's a, he's a special talent that um, I hope to also continue working with because um, he's done great things in the six months that we've been working, uh, scaling up the amateur rankings and winning a couple of pretty large events in America. Yeah, it's been awesome. So Cameron, everybody always wants one last question. I promise this is <laughs> just apropos, apropos of that. You ask, you know, players need to have different skill sets, obviously, for different conditions. They need to, you know, be able to adjust. How many different coaching manuals, you know, not, not necessarily physically, but it's kind of in your own mind, how many different coaching manuals slash approaches do you need to have given the diversity of athlete and individual you come across? That's a, gr- that's a great question. I'll give you, hopefully a pitcher will do, the, do it justice. If you're familiar with American football, gridiron, or mm. the NFL, then you're familiar with seeing coaches on the sideline holding up their play cards, these laminated sheets that are sometimes two foot wide by um, two foot tall. And those play cards have a thousand plays, let's say, all designed to do one thing, which is score. I think as a golf coach, the more plays you can have, the bigger your play sheet, the better equipped you are to solve problems. Because just because you have a play with a specific problem, let's say it's that crop dusting slice that coming over the top, you're, oftentimes the first play you call out of your playbook isn't going to be the one that works, and you need to go deep in that playbook sometimes, a three or four or five, um, five deep. And so if you don't have that, then you're going to be less effective than you otherwise would be. So coaching manuals, coaching, I guess a good word, but a scientific word would be interventions, ways to get the same job done. It needs to be a lot. Cameron, we are golf nerds here, and we could honestly, I know you have to go and we're going to yeah. let you go. We could really speak to you for another five hours about all this sort of stuff. We really appreciate you joining us. It's obviously great to have you back in Australia, and everybody that's going to have access to you up at that PGA Expo is going to be better for the experience. Keep up the great work. Uh, everybody back here in golf, for what it's worth, continues to talk about the work you're doing with players on the other side of the planet, and it's been a joy to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Cameron. Cameron McCormick joining us on Inside the Ropes. Hi, this is Sherelle McMahon. Swing Fit is the fun, healthy, social way for women to get started in golf. You'll learn the basics of the golf swing and how to putt over a six-week program and get your whole body moving through yoga and Pilates-style exercises. You don't need any golf knowledge or equipment. Simply turn up in comfy clothing and get started. You'll be surrounded by like-minded people and receive constant support. So get outdoors, meet new friends and learn a sport that you can play for the rest of your life. To find a program Visit swingfit.com.au. Hi, this is Aaron Price, and October is Golf Month. 
Golf Month is the perfect time to share with your family and friends. So get out there this October and have a go. Well, how good was that, oh. having access to him? I mean, Cameron McCoy. That was, that was uh, I reckon, off the back of every answer. I don't know about you. I mean, there would have been ten more questions yeah. that us and anybody listening would have had to ask him off just about every answer he gave. Oh, I think you're right. Like As you said, we could chat to him for hours and we wouldn't get bored and you know it's something uh, Blakey I know has interviewed him before I've spoken to him briefly in passing but he is an Australian sort of a golfing icon as as it stands or he's becoming one anyhow but so little is known of him and his thoughts and you know he's hard to access based in Texas Blakey but what a resource Look, he's got the gift of the gab, hasn't he? Like some of those little expressions and the the story told about the the ten dogs in the yeah, fight and, yeah. and picking the one that got the meat. You know, that's yeah. you can sort of see that in Jordan Spieth too, can't you? Say? Yeah, absolutely. And I think now, that was gold. A lot of people find it easier to learn visually, and when he talks about oil and water mixing, or when he talks about NFL coaches holding up boards. It makes it really easy to understand and grasp. And I think he takes joy, I know, out of coaching not only the world's number one players. But also down at a lower level. If you can get a committed player to come from 26 to 13, he's as happy as Larry. Uh, 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 yeah, absolutely. No doubt. I mean, one of his great um, success stories, and he, he he quoted it himself. I mean, um, Spieth wins the Open Championship, but he got, um, was it Laurie Cannon to finish tie 37, the young British kid who he's working with? And for him, that was, uh, it seemed like he got, well, I'm not going to say as much satisfaction out of, getting the kid to make the cut and then finish alongside Rory McIlroy and Jason Day on the same line. But, was it McIlroy? Certainly, certainly did finish alongside Day. Um, but he he did get his, he got a, a huge degree of satisfaction just seeing this young no-name mm. make the cut and then finish strong and finish in a tie for 37. So. You, you could almost sort of see, you know, metaphorically that glint in his eye when we asked him about Carl Phillips. You can see that he can see something there. You know, that needs maybe a little bit of moulding or something like that. But he can see that he wants to be involved. And he, he's not the finished product yet, like a Spieth. Mm. But he's, uh, you know, he, he can see something special. And I think that, that sets him apart. He gave an answer to your question about um, when you were asking about, you know, the chicken wing and, you know, the the the, the, the technical soundness of the Jordan Spieth game. And, you know, Hazy, you asked him about teaching most just to get the ball in the hole, teaching players to get the ball in the hole. And... Oh, he would be. Imagine the the amount of pressure that whether he even knows the number of people that have come at Jordan Spieth and Jordan Spieth's people and said, "We can make you a better player. Mm. We can improve your Absolutely. swing. Come with us. We will, you know, we will improve you." I mean, this bloke, he's okay. This Cameron McCormick, but your swing's rubbish. Your grip's terrible. We can make you a better player. The fact that McCormick is McCormick is so good at what he does. Spieth and his people have just resisted any temptation to even think about um, taking his business elsewhere. So good is the fit between this coach and that player. And, and now it's, it's turned full circle, that if that did happen, what you're just saying, because people are breaking down the door to get to Cameron. Spot McCormick. on. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we mentioned in the interview Sue O, oh, who uh, had been working out here with a few different coaches in Melbourne and then went to Cam McCormick and, and uh, he basically has tr- uh, changed their swing completely, hasn't, mm, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he has, absolutely. Uh, and boys, I'm sorry, but we failed miserably. We had two challenges. Oh, you tried. We tried them both and yeah. nothing. Not yeah. Donuts. He was donuts. he was too modest and he was far too nervous about the police ramifications around the yeah. sand belt. The fact yeah. that he'd never be allowed back into Kingston Heath, for example. Not that we're suggesting that <laughs> that was one of the clubs that he broke into. Hey, before we get to other bits and pieces of news of the week, Bob Sheeran are not too far away from joining us and we'll have a look at what's to come. Uh, don't forget you can subscribe to Inside the Ropes on Apple Podcasts. We say this every week, don't we? Surely the penny would have dropped by now. Or for Android users, download podcast apps through Google Play. Get the show delivered to your device every Thursday. You can also find Inside the Ropes on Spotify and Stitcher. If you do subscribe uh, and you like it, um, leave a review. If you don't like the show, don't leave a review. We're only interested in positive feedback here on Inside the Ropes. Um, And if you give us five stars, the way... Oh, good luck. I was going to wait. There's no no way. I'm waiting for the introduction from you. There's a five-star reviews come through. <laughs> I'll read it, but I think I'm not it's from someone from Slovenia. I don't know where that name is. That is that. I don't know what that is, but you can read the review. Yeah, there's a. Put it this way: S J T T F C G G C H H G H H V. And you'd be struggling to get it on a Scrabble board. Put it that way. No, no uh, 
That name says this has quickly become one of our favourite <laughs> podcasts. The interviews with Australia's best and most promising golfers gives levels across all tours. Keep up the great work, guys. So thanks, Alphabet. We appreciate it. <laughs> there you go. Actually, the Oz Golf website, which is one of the you know run by Michael Green, I think. Hazy uh, Aussie golfer. Oz, Aussie golfer. Yeah, they they did a list of the top Australian or top golf podcasts anywhere actually this week, and they had us in there. I think at number one. No. Oh. I'm surprised that it's taken us this long to mention that, then, if that's the case. I thought we only would have gone with that only on happened the top. this week. Why are we burying the lead, Hazy? You're well. in charge of the editorial content. What are you doing? <laughs> hey, that's... before you mention Golf Month, can I also mention to everybody who's listening, and, and I know we go to a lot of golfers around Australia, I had the great joy, and I know I think you're going to do it this year, the longest day, and I know this isn't necessarily part of our a formal um, a plug um, schedule, but the longest day is going to be on again this year. All money raised goes to the Cancer Council of Victoria here, but I believe other states are going to jump on board this year, so you can um, you can you can have a crack elsewhere. But certainly to golfers in Victoria, you've got to play seventy two holes in a day. It's a huge ask. It's meant to be difficult because people who are fighting cancer do it tough. So um, through Andrew Buxton and a couple of his mates down there, they were the brainchild at Sorrento behind this, and it's a fantastic thing. We raised over hundred grand last year. They want to raise two hundred fifty thousand this year. Um, go to the website, The Longest Day, become uh, a committed player, raise some money. Any amount of money you can raise goes to an outstanding cause. Um, it's and Go and encourage your club. Go to your club and say, I want to do this. I want to do it. I want to do it. And they will make all the pro- – they'll know about it and they will make the provisions required for you to do it possible. I second that. I went to my club a few weeks ago to start organising that and I went to Kerr Lewis and, and the manager was all over it. And I think it's not only you know people within the industry, just normal – um, you know, people who aren't even golfers who Absolutely. just want to get involved and, and just do something to support the fight against cancer. And, uh, yeah, just ring your club. Even if they haven't got it on their books, check the website and encourage them to do it. It's a great thing. And and it doesn't, the, doesn't and take out many Not at slots. all. And on the website too, Hazy, for non-club members, there's going to be some provisions made available to you at participating clubs. Great. There are going to be limited spaces available. So if you do want to do this, and you can do it on your own. You can. Do, I did it with my brother-in-law last year. It was great, and I believe I'm doing it with you this year. And and we're going to do this, all right? Yeah, before yeah. you go overseas, no um, it's the sense of satisfaction you off. get. It. You got to walk it. They'll carry him off. You got to walk unless you got serious medical exemptions. Otherwise, um, when I first rang my club, Andy, the general manager who I get on a house on fire with, g'day to Brendan Caligari. He actually said, "How many carts do you want?" And I said, "Oh, geez, I don't know if Andy's going to be happy if no, I cart seventy-two holes." No, you got to walk it. So, uh, so be, be, go to the website. You'll see the clubs that are going to participate, and if you want to take a spot, make sure you do and get involved. Um, golf month. Golf month. Uh, it's coming along rapidly now. Some awesome videos. If you check out golfmonth.com.au or via the uh, golf. Australia website directly uh, and don't forget we're giving you the chance to win one of four ultimate golf bug adventures to Barn Bugle, Cape Wickham, Cape Wickham even and Ocean Dunes thanks to Air Adventure Golf Tours. All you have to do is tell us in 150 words or less who you're going to share the golf bug with this October and how to, and you do that via golfmonth.com.au. Uh, hundreds of great activities on that website. Clubs are all around Australia from Arnhem Land right down to the south of Tassie. From the west up to the far north, Queensland, everywhere, to get involved uh, and get your club involved if you want to see the game of golf flourish. Awesome. And the Vic Open, have you got some news about the bits and, magnificent Bits and Vic pieces Open? of tournament news, starting with the Vic Open, uh, Andy. The dates were announced during the week, 1 to 4 February next year. And the prize money is going to be a minimum of $1.3 million, which is up again on last year, Six fifty per the women's event, Six fifty for Brilliant. the men. So got equal Brilliant. prize money like the Australian Open Tennis, Mel Reed's playing Belen Motho from uh, Spain. Uh, you know, it's it's a really growing event. It's, it's a six year in a row at Thirteenth Beach, which has proved to be a sensational venue for it. it's been hugely supported by the public down there, and so that was good. And uh, I noticed Hazy, there's a New Zealand Masters on the Australasian PGA Tour, eleven to fourteen January next year. It's a new tournament, Wainui Golf Club near Auckland. They're going to have. Uh, after the cut, halfway cut, they're going to have 50 amateurs and 50 pros playing together in a team competition, Great. which is kind of separate to the actual pro tournament. So that's think, that's uh, a good one as well. I think they've had great feedback to the uh, – I think it's the New Zealand Open where they have that mm. – not the PGA, yeah, the New Zealand Open – where they have that pro am format through the yeah. round, so you know it's great to see another tournament coming onto the schedule. I just say it's one thing on the Vic Open. If you haven't, you've heard probably heard us on this podcast talk about it a lot, and you've probably heard over the last few years people talk about it a lot. 
if you haven't been down to experience a day at 13th, <clears throat> um, you're missing out. It is such a relaxed environment. It is unbelievably welcoming. It's obviously very affordable. Uh, you can walk the fairways with the players. Um, the men's side is an unbelievably competitive field. The women's side is almost, it's world class. Oh, yeah, absolutely world class. So um, you get to see some of the best players on the planet and you can walk alongside them, literally. So if you're thinking about, you know, maybe just getting in the car or jumping on the train one day and getting down to 13th um, to see what it's all about, I thoroughly, thoroughly encourage you to do it. It's, it's Are we going to get to FedEx Cup? Uh, we will at the end. end. Just before we yep. get to Bob, before we get to news coming up, news retrospective. Did, were you watching Cron Cercier? Were you watching the way that all played out at the end? Absolutely staggering. It was just hard to watch in the end. I mean, Scotty Hand was beaten in a playoff last year. Alex Noren, I think, got him yep. last year on his way to you know top ten status in the world. Alex Noren again this year. Hand has been there, you know, the whole way through the four rounds. Um, and has it in the palm of his hand on the second playoff hole. He's got a six-footer, not much in the putt. It's eminently makeable. He makes that putt, you know, falling out of bed nine times out of ten, and he tugged it to the left and gave Matt Fitzpatrick another look at it, and then he bugged up the third playoff hole, and Ian, with a bogey, and loses the playoff to par, which... And he's unbelievably phlegmatic about all this sort of stuff, and he's put the tweet out, and he's, you know, all that. But this must... I reckon deep down in the core, for a bloke who's pretty, you know, cavalier about life and takes what it gives him and doesn't bitch and moan too much, I reckon he'd be pretty. He'll be pretty gutted about losing that one. When you play, he played the eighteenth three times in the playoff, once in the fourth round, and had to finish his third round on the final day. Five times up the eighteenth, went in the fairway bunker four times. Yeah. He's got to find one shot here. I know he didn't drop a shot every time. Um, but, you know, it's easy to find one shot. And normally you're right, Andy, he just brushes it off, keeps going, and I've got another tournament on the other side of the world. He did a later tweet after the ones he did leaving Switzerland um, when he was back in, in the US. I think he's very grateful to go home after Irma, Hurricane Irma, yeah, and find yeah. his wife and family were all, you know, and his house were all in one piece, which is fantastic. Um, but he actually said, jet lag is real, or maybe it's that I continue to think about that part on the second playoff hole. And that's something that's unhandy. Like, I, you know, we're gro- growing admiration for Handy, and he's just brutal honesty. He's obviously he's just fessed up to that's really hurting me. And and again, it's one of those chances because he he needs he needs these things to get into WGC events or Masters or anything. Yeah. He can kick his ranking yeah. up to inside the top fifty, get yeah. a spot on the US Tour, whatever it is that is his goal. You know, these are the things he's got to do. These are the goals he's got to kick. Well, he's actually jumped on a plane and gone back, and he's playing on the Web.com tour this it's weekend, playoffs, which right, is yeah. gr- he's grinding out there again. Because I think deep down he just wants to get back on the US tour. So, uh, look, I felt a bit sorry for him in the sense that he was leading all the way through. I think he had lead first round, share of lead second round, lead third round. He had very hard to lead any pro tournament uh, from wire to wire like that. Uh, you know, there's always someone nipping at heels, and in this case, it was, uh, you know. Yeah. Bad luck for has his schedule? Asia, Fiji. We we got to him on his uh, week off. Mate. Then he's gone and played Web dot com, Switzerland. Back to Web dot com. He is he is the mountain man. He, pardon the pun here with Switzerland of of global golf travel. No doubt. And, and you, when we had him on the show, you intro introed him as such, and mm. rightly so. But again, I reckon there's a bit of him thinking my game's in the best nick it's ever been. Oh, yeah. I'm playing as well as I've ever played. I am a world-class player now. Yeah. I think he would love, if he could get two or three years on the PJ Tour right now, not that it's the be-all and end-all, but it is the main game from a week-in-week-out week in, week in, week tour perspective. I reckon he thinks he could get on that tour and actually do a bit of damage this time around. He, he's very self-effacing with his game. He knows it's not perfect every week. Mm. But he, above pretty much all Australian players, and there's some great players who can really peel off a score. You know, we've seen Appleby shoot 59, etc. You know, um, just Alistair Preston will peel off a 60 here and there. Uh, look, he's a bloke in two or three good days and a big event on the USPJ Tour can set himself up for the rest of his life because mm. he has got an unbelievable ability to shoot birdies. He's yep. just got to have one good week. That's all he's got to have, one good week. And I reckon he knows that. Oh, I'd, right. I'd really like to ask him the question in about five years' time that we asked him a few weeks ago, his final round next to um, Hideki Matsuyama at the Bridgestone when he had it all there in front of him. Everything was laid out in front of him in one round and he didn't get to it. And he was self-effacing, but I reckon that'll he'll think about that if he doesn't get to it. 
Yeah, I agree with that. G'day, I'm My Golf Ambassador Jason Day. I'm really excited to be an ambassador for My Golf, Australian Golf's National Junior Program, jointly run by Golf Australia and the PGA. My Golf is every Aussie kid's first step on their golfing pathway. It's all about teaching children the basic skills of golf in a safe and healthy environment. And just as importantly, about the life skills that golf can teach you that distinguish our sport from the rest. Remember to visit mygolf.org.au for more information. G'day guys, I'm Scott Hen. I'm around the world playing golf everywhere, but when I can, I'll publish the Inside the Ropes. Time now to talk the road to the Australian Open, which is an innovative part of Inside the Ropes that one of you, we think one of you two guys came up with this, I reckon. We're nothing if not innovative. Who deserves the credit for this? I'll put my hand up. Oh, well done, Blakey. <laughs> I like talking to the old fellas, Bob. Oh, we do. do. Well, he's here. Bob Shearer is our first guest in uh, the road to the Open. Of course, we go back to 1982 when at the Australian, it was an action-packed Australian Open back then that Bob Shearer won. And Unique. Good, Unique. Good enough. To, well, it was on so many levels. Bob Shearer, the winner of that event, joins us. Hello, Bob. Hey boys, how are you? Thanks for joining us in Inside the Ropes. Uh, when, when you think, when we ask you just initially to think back to '82 and what happened up at the Australian, you know that five or six days for you, you know the couple leading in, and then you know the four days of the tournament, are the memories really sharp for you? Well, it's thirty-five years, and they are still <laughs> sharp. Yeah, I <laughs> say when you get old and silly, the long memory's good and the short's bad. <laughs> So what when when you when you kind of are asked to and there's specifics we'll ask you obviously about what happened up there and you know the, the greater career of you know B Shearer a bit or R Shearer but when we ask you to remember eighty two what's the sharpest memory you have of winning that championship? Oh, probably playing with Jack Nicholas for three days. You become oh, quite quite friendly with him over the years, though, hadn't you? It wasn't like the first time you'd actually oh, pegged it up no. with him. You'd, you'd had really good no. dealings with him over a number of years in the US oh, in particular. I, mean, I, I played with him the first two days at St Andrews in 78, which he finished up winning. But, um, you know, you're right. I, I was very fortunate. He was my boyhood hero, and I finished up playing a fair bit with him. And hey. uh, obviously, two day, the first two days... That week, and then uh, I often say when he talks and everything, he, he didn't play well enough to play with me on the Saturday, but he got, <laughs> he got his game around to come with me on the Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> So the fact that you'd won over in the US that year, I mean, you, obviously you had, you know, you'd been crossing paths with him for many, many years coming into that event, but for the fact that you'd won on the PJ Tour that year, did, how big a shot in the arm for you was that from a confidence level? Oh, yeah, I think, yes, it was. It was. I, you got that in the back of your mind. And But the, the Australian Open was a different deal. I I probably could have won two or three up to that stage, but just all I can say is I choked every time because try, you're trying too hard to win it and um, just couldn't get there. But uh, I think he to help take my mind off everything. Um, we had all the people following him and, you know, it was just, Full on for four days, and uh, you just don't want to make a fool of yourself playing with a guy like that. So. We well, certainly uh, didn't make a fool of yourself, no, Bob. No. I watched the video the other night. There's a video on the, uh, and I'd great. recommend this to people who look at it, uh, golf.org.au on the Golf Australia website. There's a video of that particular open. I'm not sure whether you've watched it, Bob, but uh, yeah. when you got the 72nd hole, you must have been a couple in front, I'd say. Nicholas is playing with you. He bombs a drive out there. It's par five at the Australian, obviously, so he's going to try and get home in two. First of all, you've knocked it straight past him yeah. off the tee. Then you've gone for the green Why? and knocked it on the green. I'm watching it and I'm going, Bob, just lay it up. <laughs> no, well, you must have been in the zone, Bob. <laughs> Funny you should say that because he actually hit it on the back of the green. With a, yeah. With a one on or something like that. And I got to my ball. I had Lauren Terity caddy him for me. And I sort of looked at him and said, you know, how far is it? He said 135. You're kidding. I said, what? 135? <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, no, you, lay, you just lay up. All oh, right. He wanted what? you to lay up. I said, what? Lay up. You've got to be joking, mate. But I'm, it went through my mind that if I laid up, I could dump three balls in the water <laughs> with a wedge. And if I hit, hit which I know, I hit a three iron in the end, but 
I knew if it, if it hit land and went in the water, it didn't matter. I'd drop on the edge of the ground, I'd chip in three putt and win. So laying up only said to me, I'm going to, uh, you know, you, you, you've got a chance of stuffing it up. <laughs> you know, but uh, he, he wouldn't give me a yardage to the front of the green. He said, no, no, we've got to lay up. And then, then a guy called Bob Wilson was from Dunlop. He was, he was a member there and he was head marshal. And he even got in on it. Oh, <laughs> he told you to lay up, did he? Lay up. Yeah, head marshal's telling me to lay up. Now, you, no, you, uh, you know, Bob, I've always known you as being a very uh, genial sort of a fella, and all your friends out at Southern Golf Club would say the same. But when I watched this video, uh, there was an incident on the 14th the hole 14th. where you're about to, about to hit your approach to the 14th green. And I think if, uh, from what the commentator said, a photographer stepped on a branch or something like that, and oh, you actually had head. a few words to say to him. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be any good this day. Don't want... They'd hear everything I said. But, no, but it, it was in the tree, I think, and the branch broke. Of course, it, it's got to break right in the middle of your backswing. You can't do it after it or before it. Anyway, I, I, I didn't say too much to him. And you you hold out for birdie anyway. When you, you missed the green, then hold out for birdie, as I understand. Well, I hit it in the trees and chipped it out and then uh, pitched it in from 60 yards. Mike Clayton wanted to, uh, us to ask you about what happened on the 13th hole in the bunker. 15th. The 15th. 15th hole. Yeah, on da- Was it day, day one? one. Or? Yeah. Yeah, you, got it, you, you were assessed a penalty or you assessed yourself a penalty? Well, yeah, well, I hit the bunker shot and I, the ball landed out of the bunker. And I, I mean, I guess I gave the sand a bit of a hit, but nothing. There's, r- there's proof of that on the video. Yeah, well, it wasn't too hard. Right. <laughs> That was I was mellowed by then. That had been four or five years previous. Most of that sand to be out of the bunker. <laughs> but, but the ball but, rolled back in, right? But when then when I stepped up, the the ball was in the bunker. So, well, that's you know it's a two shot penalty. So you assessed yourself, but Mike Clayton told me that uh, well, Nick, Nicholas have... Nicholas said that you you would have, should have been okay. Yeah, well, he had my card, and he said yes, and then. I, Nothing was done until we finished, and by that time, you know, the phones were running hot to the PGA and to the golf club and to everyone, everything there. And the strange thing about it, a lot of people were saying I was a cheat in the, over the phone to them. And, I mean, you, you have to sit down and go through it. When we finished, you don't put a score down and say that's it. And, um, anyway, Nick was said I shouldn't have a have a penalty and I, I just said to him I've got it. I said I can't I couldn't live with myself tomorrow mm. looking at people looking at me and thinking he cheated even if I hadn't cheated <laughs> when I, so I had to take the penalty and I think it probably helped in the end of the day might have focused you a little bit. Well, the, well the, just yeah. interesting, Bob, that you would say that you know you couldn't live with yourself because do you see that happening in the modern? era all the time we've seen a couple of incidents this year i'm not sure whether you were aware of them where pros in tournaments in america have been burying their feet down in bunkers i think charlie hoffman was one and he asked yeah. for a ruling because his heels hit a little bit of a base underneath the the sand that the bunker was built on and uh, got a, a free drop do you, do you see the players still doing that do you think that that sort of oh. self self uh, policing i think so yes I mm. think it's one of the few games that uh, in all professional sports that, that does self-police. How often do you reckon, Bob, that players... I was watching one of the FedEx... Patrick Cantley last well, two weeks ago now. Uh, he just he'd sort of knocked it through the back of the green and, and he was trying to get a ruling just just simply to get a better lie. He'd sort of come to rest off the second cut off the back of the green. and His ball was completely playable, but he wanted to get a drop away from a drain because, you know, he just wanted to get a better lie. I mean, and he, and he was denied that. I mean, back in your day, I guess there were still players back then who were trying to use the rules to their advantage. Is that This is not something new, I suppose. Well, yeah, um, you can you can say use to your... Well, you'll use them to your advantage. That's what they're there for. Mm. Um, but it's, you know... I think they, the players seem to ask for a silly ruling more so now. I don't think they know the rules as well as maybe we did in our time because there wasn't as many rules people around. I mean, you, 
you could stand there for half an hour, wait for a real bloke to come. But um, I, I, I think you know, and the money they play for now. I mean, you know, one shot could cost you a couple hundred grand. No. Yeah, you used <laughs> so, a long you used a long putter for a while, didn't you? Oh, I tried it. Yeah. The, yeah, the, this is this is one of the big you know bugbears in world golf right now. The whole anchoring of the long putter. Have you got a have you got a view on that? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I, well, I think they did the right thing. You shouldn't anchor it. That's all. And then I noticed a couple of blokes are still using it. And if they're not anchoring, I'm not talking to you. Yeah. Mm. I saw that bloke uh, on the seniors tour the other week, and his shirt was moving when he was putting. <laughs> so you can't tell me that that's not. On his bloody chest. <laughs> you know, it starts out away from the chest, but by the time he's about to hit it, it's on there. Yeah. And, you know, I think he's been called a few times by players, you know, that say that basically telling him he's cheating, I guess. But, um, I don't know. But, no, I, I, I think it was wrong. I always think of Randall Vines. He he was one of the first to use a long putter, and he had it up near his chin, but not on his chin and not on his chest. It was actually away from his body. He never anchored it, and you know, obviously, other blokes went on the chin and on the chest and all that. But I never really tried the long one. I, I, I had the belly putter. That oh. was. Uh, hey Bob, what was the? Uh prize check for winning the Open in 82, do you remember? Oh. And, and you would have had a few beers that night, I reckon. Well, Nick was put his 50,000 prize money in. It was quite funny that. <laughs> he, he, uh, we were playing the first round and I thanked him because it was in the paper. Obviously, he's, he put his 50,000 into the prize money, his appearance fee. You know, probably, well, Packer gave it to him and that's in a... But um, I said, that's very nice of you. And, and I just said to him, I said, is it covered first prize or what? And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it filters down like normal, you know, everywhere. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I did ask him a question on Sunday night in the press conference. <laughs> I said, you sure that 50's not going into the winner's check? <laughs> so what was the check in the oh, end? I think it was about a bit over 40,000, I think. And you would have had a couple of beers that night? Well, I flew back to Melbourne. That's right. And oh, uh, had an it. ice bath and uh, did some rehab. <laughs> well, we got back because Kathy wasn't up there. She, she'd flown from, we'd played in Tweed Heads the week before and she went straight home. Funny thing was I told her I'll see her on Friday night because I didn't like the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Bob, and the clubhouse I, burnt down too. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence and I... <laughs> got home, it was dark, obviously. I don't know what flight we got, but it was nine o'clock or something like that time. And I turned the corner in my house, and it's, it's, it's dark. It's all the house is dark. I said, it looks like we're having a drink on our own, Lawrence. I opened the bloody door, and there was 50 people in there. <laughs> Fantastic. My, buddy, my missus had done all that, and they, she'd, they made them park around the corners, and there there's no cars there. <laughs> Well, Cathy Shearer, for our listeners who, who aren't aware, Cathy Shearer is a legend of Australian golf in her, in her own right and who runs well, the media centre. She used to be Bob Shearer's husband, and I'm now Cathy Shearer's wife, I mean, yeah. Bob Shearer's wife, and now I'm her husband. You know. Where did you uh, get changed at the Australian that year? Because five weeks before the Open, the clubhouse burnt to the ground and it was a, a shell of a building. Yeah, it was a there's extraordinary <laughs> photographs uh, of of people hitting off the first tee with this sort of uh, structure behind them that's burnt down. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, they were oh, pretty much upmarket tent, I suppose. But I guess you probably didn't bring as much stuff to the course as you normally do when you've got a locker type deal. <laughs> but uh, it seemed to work all right. I mean, unbelievable that. You're right. Looking at the clubhouse, Bob. Bob, how how um you mentioned before Kerry Packer and his influence, especially at the Australian and on the Australian Open in that era. Walk us through, you know, going to Kerry Packer's house at some <laughs> at some point in your life. Like, it, it, 
He's obviously a very gregarious guy for athletes in particular. What was that like going there? Maybe even with Jack Nicholas. Yeah, well, he used to he used to bring out a I don't know half a dozen blokes from the from the states. He'd just pick hand pick them, and and he and to his credit, he paid everybody the same amount. Nobody was except Jack, of course, you know, and it was his course and the whole lot. And the, um, um, and he had a night usually, well, every year he'd have a night where he, I don't know, maybe 15 pros, 20 pros go. And and uh, in the house, it was a fair house. It was quite a size. <laughs> <laughs> we could have all stayed there, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one, I don't know if I should say this, but one thing I did notice when the first time we went, Kathy and I, every picture or painting that I saw was there was an animal in the throes of death you know like in the safaris in Africa or whatever and shooting things and everything and I thought this could get a bit dangerous by the end of the night. <laughs> I wonder if that's how Kerry saw himself Bob he was the one killing the, the weak <laughs> I reckon he probably had that view of himself somewhere tucked oh, away there weren't any uh, Channel 9 executives <laughs> uh, in those pictures <laughs> You know, to be quite honest, I, I really got on well with him and I liked him. And he, he was he was a very nice bloke. He was, his outward persona really wasn't him. Mm. He was, you know, obviously a hard businessman, but I would think probably pretty fair yeah. if he got his own way. Did you ever play golf with him? No, I never played with him, but I, I was at Muirfield Village, Nich- Nicholas's tournament, and I had some time with him there. And... and uh, he came out in the practice round. I don't think it was a. It might have been eighty-two. We were on the eighth tee and in the cart just to have a look at the course and say hello to a few blokes. So he he got me in that cart for two holes, you know, and we just had a chat and I sort of got a different picture of him. And, 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 and I mean, he was great for golf in this country. I mean, he, he you know should have stayed there for. You know, I guess we all know the reason why it didn't, but it, it uh, came where, you know, he'd throw the money in if it was needed, and that's it, you know. It, uh, I liked him. He was, <laughs> didn't have to put up with anything if you were with him, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, just another story from Muirfield Village. I think I read somewhere that, uh, back before that, maybe 76, when you were starting to know Jack and, for that matter, Barbara Nicholas as well, that they might have invited you out for dinner and ended up in a sort of a, a funny situation in an ice creamery. It did, yes. Yep, that was uh, that was 76. That was the first tournament at Muirfield. And um, we had dinner at the Hilton where we were staying at and uh, with Barbara and Jack and... Uh, um, he asked if we wanted desserts, and I said, yeah, I'll have a dessert, we'll have a dessert. And he said, right, and we got in the car. I mean, this is Jack Nicholas, he's driving the car. I mean, that wouldn't happen these days. <laughs> but we drove down the road to to an ice cream shop, which he obviously knew, or well, he probably owned the bloody thing. <laughs> but um, they all... All the blokes and girls behind the thing knew him, knew who it was. But him and I sat in the gutter and ate ice cream. That's unbelievable. And isn't it? Every now and then there'd be a toot of a horn because there'd be someone driving by and say, "Hey, that's Jack Nicklaus." Oh, who's the bloke you know? with Jack? Yeah, I mean, who's the bloke with Bob? No, they should, they that's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Bob, just one more thing about the Australian Open, uh, specifically. A couple of years ago, you came up. You were part of the hundredth celebrations and yep. we had as many past champions as we could muster there together I, I know that was a pretty I wouldn't say emotional but it was a pretty um, a, a moving moment for you to, to get you said you missed a couple of chances at the Australian Open to get that one now and be part of that sort of recognition and be part of that honour roll is that something you look back on with just unbelievable fondness yes I do yeah yeah my word it was um, 
you know, it was part and part. I was trying too hard to win the thing because you know, it wasn't. It, there's a few more now, but at that stage, there's only about six, I think, six or seven that had won the amateur and the open. And um, that was part of me trying to get into that part of the fellas. But to, I think in the end, to win it on that course up there in Sydney and and. Nicholas brought the people. I don't think they've ever had crowds in Sydney like that that oh, week. God. He he brought them through the gate in their droves. Mm. I'm walking down that last hole on the Sunday. That whole hill, because there's no clubhouse there, so the, the whole hill was just people. Mm. Um, I've got no idea how many got through were there, but there was a lot, you know. And it's just uh, something I'll never forget. I can almost tell you every shot from the first hit to the last hit. That's awesome. So it's um, well entrenched in my mind, and I'm you know proud and happy that I did it. You know, finally. Oh, that's great. And um, that was one question. Um, just that, the fact that you did complete that double, you know, having won the amateur in 69 and the Open in 82. Uh, you know, you've won tournaments all over the world, Bob, but how proud are, are you of, of being able to complete that double and you look back on it now? Oh, yeah. And plus, I, in that one, I I whipped the Australian PGA in before I defended the Australian Open title. So it was... Yeah. I, I'm not sure there's too many bikes have held the Australian PGA and the Open at one time. And and you still enjoy getting back to the home club just before we let you go and hanging out with the you know your mates who have been mates with you at Southern presumably for decade upon decade now. It's still you still enjoy that environment. Oh yeah, I love it. You know, like I've, I think Andy, the last time I might have seen you was down at Warrington when it was. I finished up with a foot in bloody plaster. It was. Well, that that was that, I broke bones in there, and that was all last year. That was the twenty. What was that? About the twenty sixth of February. So the next time I hit a golf ball was just before Christmas, and then I only lasted a month, and I was back in bloody traction for another four months. So it was it was nearly eighteen months before I could get a crack. I've had a sort of a month at it now. Uh, Back winning club comps. And the truth be known, I think I nearly killed you once at the National, didn't I, with a shank. Did that take that, a couple of years off your life? <laughs> I actually shanked that, the ball right past his nose. He was playing in my group. Do you remember that? Yeah, I don't stand in those positions anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure never you stand assume. behind Martin Blake. Never assume a 20 handicap is going to get it where it's supposed to go, Bob. That's the, well, you should know that. <laughs> I, I was doing, when I came back playing you know, after the thing, I, I started to have a few of them. <laughs> oh. But the, the boys I play with it don't give you any any help or anything. But they said they were very proud of the way that, that I get my shanks go nice and high. <laughs> well, it's, it's the good players, can, uh, good players, I'm bad shot. That's what I say. I can get them over the trees onto the next fairway. <laughs> very handy. It's a great well, skill to have, Bob. Murray, before you before we let Bob go, he's too he's he's too modest to tell you that he actually scooped the pools down at Southern a couple of sad days ago. Thirty eight points, no, got the chocolate. Thirty eight points on a Wednesday. It was yeah, Wednesday. It was yesterday, week ago, and I nearly got it again yesterday. Old um. Jordan McKenzie, Sandra McKenzie's son, had 40 points and I had 39. Oh, so, wow. Wow. You're in good nick. Good well, work, well, Fantastic. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it's a joy to have you on the show. This is the first part of our Road to the Open series that we're going to be doing on our podcast, Bob, and uh, we couldn't have kicked it off with a, a better ambassador and a better bloke for Australian golf. Thanks for joining us on the show. I oh, appreciate that, Andy. And boys... Good on, Good you, on Bob. you, Bob. I'll see you, see you up at the Open. Absolutely. Perfect. Bob Thanks, Shearing mate. joining us on Inside. I might, I've, I've got a chance of getting in the media centre. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you had a chance of getting in the field. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm for, oh, no, fortunately, I'm too old. <laughs> yeah, I reckon you'll be right for a free cup of tea if you need one. Bob Shearer joining us at Inside the Roads. The Golf Australia website is now the place to go to look up your handicap and so much more. Whether you're out and about on your phone or in the office, trying to avoid work, just go to golf.org.au and punch a golf link number into the box at the top of the homepage. Who knows, maybe that last round was just good enough to put you in single figures. While you're on the site, check out the daily golf results at your club, view our course index for up-to-date ratings, 
Read the latest golf news from home and abroad, listen to Australian golf podcasts and interviews, and watch video tournament highlights or tips to improve your game. It's everything a golf tragic could want. Visit golf.org.au today, the home of Australian golf. Hi, Stuart Appleby here with October coming up. It's time to share the golf bug with a friend. So fantastic to have Bob Shearer on the show and a lot to look forward to when we get to the Australian Open again this year. Great to have the big fella up and about. and He's unbelievable. I, I could listen to him again. Yeah. Another another interviewee that you know we could listen to for hours. I, it's it's a classic. We You mentioned Cathy Shearer in passing there. Uh, the two of them were inducted into the Australian Golf Riders Association Hall of Fame, whatever it is uh, called, a few years ago. And they had an hour to do their speech. <laughs> And you hear Bob. Bob's a great character there talking away. Kathy spoke for 57 minutes <laughs> of their acceptance speech hour. I'm not, without a word of a lie. It was unbelievable. The, the greatest golfing couple I've ever met. Yeah, no, they're lovely people. Um, so just before we wrap it up, uh, there's a bit to look forward to this week. The FedEx Cup playoffs resume. We've got 70 left. That gets whittled down. To 30, uh, we've got Mark Leishman and Jason Day inside the 30 at the moment. Cam Smith at 56. Needs something pretty special to get himself He's into He's got to go top four, Andy. Okay, that's pretty special. That's, yeah. yeah, that's going to be He's got to go top 40 to get into the Tour Championship. Rory McIlroy needs to go top five. Okay, right. So, so he's Phil, under the yeah. pump. And Phil's outside 30 as well, I think I read. Um, so, well, Mac, Mac, Mickelson definitely is. So Jason Day's at 28, so I think he has to finish in the top 30. He'll have Luke Reardon on the bag, which we mentioned just quickly earlier. But, Hazy, Luke Reardon's got visa problems, is that right? That's his school friend, by the way, from Corralbin College. Yeah, I think um, he's only entitled to work for a couple of weeks in this new role until it gets sorted out more formally, if that's the way Jason goes. But I understand, Blakey, that he's got uh, another old mate of his who's a touring pro part-time, I suppose, a little bit these days, David Luteris uh, from oh. South, South Australia. So that's for the President's Cup. For the President's Cup on the mm. bag, for the President's Cup in a couple of weeks. So that's it's, it's a fascinating turn of events at a, at a crucial part of the year. So there's a pl- there's a name. I know we'll get a bit sad. Uh, remember Luteris ten years ago. I, he won just, a tournament in Adelaide. Oh, I'm, I'm plucking a figure, a number out of my head, but it yeah. feels like ten years ago we thought this bloke's going to be a really serious player. He went over to America. I think he got status on the secondary tour. Might have yeah, played. Mm, he did he played a bit of PG. He played on the PGA tour a few times and got mm. some starts on. But his game just for whatever reason just seemed to not go where we thought it was going to go. Just mm. another one of those players. With, you know? no, with no offence to him at all, because he's clearly got a great golf game, he's not going to be the guy who Cam McCormick's going to find picking up the meat in that scrum of the 10 dogs. Yeah, that's... No offence to him. Yep, yep. He's just not that bloke. He's just not that driven yep. to, to stick the teeth in and get the meat, the hard meat. Is there such a stat as a hard, hard meat? meat? A hard meat get. Uh, I don't know. We <laughs> not can sure we where can, that's going. Uh, now, the Evian Championship this weekend, Andy. <laughs> the last Evian of the Evian Championship, yeah. the last of the women's majors. It's a place called Evian, Evian Le Bain. I'm glad you're moving Civil past play. hard meat get. You're a true professional. <laughs> Minji Lee is ranked 12th on the uh, season long uh, rankings. She finished, uh, had her best finish in a major this year, tied third. I, I'm thinking Minji could jump up and win one soon. But Coming off another top 10 last week. Yes. Yep. A bit of form shown there. Sue O's in the field. Sarah Jane Smith, Catherine Kirk, Kari Webb, all in the field in Evian Le Bain. I'm you're still getting. Fine. I'm still getting over your Andalusian style Belen Mutho, <laughs> and now you're cranking up with a bit of high I'm, Alp I'm, French. I'm, I'm it's really really close to Belen. <laughs> Different times. Um, so you've been we played in the pro am with her. Yeah, I'm fully aware. It was you one of the what great. I meant. It was one of the great days of our golfing. Not sure you've ever really. Hazy and I, moved no, past Hazy and I played with Belen. Um, oh, I know you keep telling me about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So not only is it a big tournament from the Australians' perspective, <laughs> but um, given the fact that it's last major of the year. The number one world ranking is still up for grabs, and it could be a three. Is, is it officially a three-way race? So I'm not 100% sure of that, but I know that Lexi well, Thompson is. won last week. She's she at did. number two on the world rankings, and So Yon Yu is still holding the number one I spot. I think so. uh, uh, Hyun, uh, Sung Hyun Park of South Korea can also still finish number one in the world. So yeah, uh, if things go her way, I, mm. did I read somewhere during the week? And you read a lot of stuff. Lexi Thompson has now broken through the eight million dollars career earning mark. Did I read that? Uh, I think it was Lydia Ko. Was it Lydia Ko? Was yeah, it? she set the. She was, became the youngest person okay, to right, reach that milestone. To reach it was Lydia Ko. There, I'm getting the names mixed and, up. And interestingly, like Lydia, a favourite of Australian golf fans, she's got a great passion for Australia as well as New Zealand. Um, found her game. 
a little mm. bit. Like it, it's coming. It's not rushing back to her like she hoped it would, I'm sure, but she's showing signs that it's not dead yet. Yeah, it's Monty Python true. style. Very true. <laughs> Fortunately, she's still got all her limbs intact <laughs> um, to use uh, to try and get back to the number one spot in the world. Uh, anything else before we want to wrap it up? Just quickly, Andy, general business. Uh, the RNA and the USGA put out a survey in the last six months or so of uh, all golfers to com- you know to comment or provide feedback on the rule changes that they've talked about. And there are a number of things here to do with... Uh, Three minutes to find your lost ball if you can find it. Uh, sp- repairing spike marks on dreams uh, on greens, different styles of drops. Uh, they haven't really uh, said much about what the responses were, but what they did say was that there were twenty two thousand golfers from one hundred and two countries uh-huh. who provided written feedback on those rules. So that's gone back to the uh, joint committee of the RNA and the USGA, and that by uh, they're, they're going to bring the rules back from thirty four rules to twenty four. And it starts in 2019. So that's going to be really interesting. Yeah, it will be. Um, mm. do, do we have little black book specials on this show? We, we no, may if play, we don't. Players yeah. to watch? We absolutely need to. Uh, have you heard about this Rayhan Thomas? No. Oh, yes. The kid from India? Yes, I have. Oh, nine birdies? Oh, the, on, in, it tied a record in an official world golf ranking event, Dubai Creek, during the week. Nine straight birdies he had, which is as long a streak as has been recorded by anyone in an event with this sort of status. He's only 17 years old. And apparently the spruik on him out of India has been um, strong since he since I, he first came under their radar as a pre-teen. And um, he played alongside Darren Clark when he shot those nine straight birdies. And Clark, apparently, his socks were knocked off just watching this kid play. Clark, after the, after the round, said that was the worst score the kid could have had. Wow. Like that was the worst score he could have had. Mm. He left. He left a few out there. So, um, you know, we're looking for the next wave and the next great players. And you don't want to lump a seventeen-year-old kid with no. that tag, but uh, it might just be a name worth watching on the way sure. through. One last thing, Andy, mm. I, and I encourage people to go and find this on Twitter or whatever social media you use. Just a little. No, no, nothing that oh, you've done, Blakey. I promise. Oh. I saw Jordan Spieth today. Throw out the first pitch at a Chicago Cubs game. Did you guys see that? I've seen no, that. I, oh, I have seen that. So I, I encourage you to go and see because there's really Left cute, hand. cute. Mo- oh, thanks for wrecking the whole punchline. Sorry. Oh, okay. Really. <laughs> I could he see threw, where it was going. He, I was staggered. I had no idea. Jordan Spieth, as right handed as it looks by his golf swing, mm. threw out the first I, pitch left handed. I was shocked as well. That's Haven't why you seen I, him mark his card? Does he mark with left hand? I think he does. Mm. I think I've noticed this now that you mention it. Right. I've never paid any attention at all, but yeah, he's, he, he looked completely natural, like you know, just an, mm. another ordinary athlete throwing down a, a ball. But uh, heaved it down. It was. I know that some people have you know different mechanics for two-handed sports as opposed to one, but yeah, I was just. Oh, I don't I didn't know,